Hi guys, and welcome back for episode seven of Unfiltered. Today's episode has been in the making for a couple of months now. Today's guest, Nia Patterson, reached out to me when I uploaded a video responding to a YouTuber back in May who was making some pretty fat phobic, quite privileged comments about eating disorder recovery. Posting response videos is always a little bit anxiety inducing, uh, but I'm so grateful that I posted this one in particular because it introduced me to Nia's amazing work. Nia is a writer and advocate who generously shares her own eating disorder recovery online, particularly on Instagram at her account, The Friend I Never Wanted, and on her incredible podcast, Body Trauma. She also speaks about fat phobia and racism within eating disorder recovery spaces, including treatment and her own journey towards becoming anti-diet. We get into all of that and much more in today's podcast. Given the events of the past four or five weeks since the murder of George Floyd, I think this episode could not be more timely. We need to do better in eating disorder awareness and treatment spaces. That much will be clear by the end of this episode and some of the statistics we share with you. Uh, but words are not enough. Nia kindly nominated two charities where I'm going to be donating all of my online revenue for July, including the AdSense from this podcast over on YouTube. Nia has nominated the National Queer and Trans Therapists of Colour Network and a GoFundMe page, which was set up for Rayshard Brooks. Uh, let me also be clear that money is not enough. I am personally committed to continuing to educate myself on anti-racism, particularly as it relates to my role as an eating disorder recovery coach and advocate who I am highlighting, how I am amplifying other voices, and I mean that for the long term. Uh, and I hope you'll all join me in doing the same. But for now, let's get into today's episode. So Nia, thank you so much for agreeing to be on the podcast today. I am so excited to have you here. Uh, just want to start off with three quick questions so that everyone can sort of get to know who we're chatting with today. First question is, what is your favorite quote or mantra? Okay, so I was trying to pick these because um, I, I knew the questions and <laughs> I am like a horrible rule breaker. So like I have two. Go for well, it. That was four. That was four. But it's it's two. <laughs> for the it's visual two. component, she's <laughs> got four fingers up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my first one is by Audre Lord, mm -hmm. who I love. Um, and her quote was when we speak, we are afraid of our words. We were we are afraid our words will not be heard or welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak beautiful love that like I just love everything Audre Lorde just to be honest um <laughs> my second quote is actually a quote that someone told me in treatment by Maya Angelou mm -hmm. um so two amazing women um but the second quote is there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you beautiful so. and couldn't be more relevant for that recovery process both just like speak to my soul like I'm very honest I am someone right like I'm someone who doesn't like to speak up about things or like to tell my story sometimes mm -hmm. and like like it's important like yes it only hurts you if you keep it inside absolutely sometimes it so. is part of your process to unveil it right where you know being Definitely. private about it is important at times and then I think the shame component of an eating disorder is important to work through and that's giving it a voice and, and just, you know, being able to find that community through sharing and saying, Oh my God, I'm not alone. Yeah. And it's so much easier. It's just kind of funny. It's easier for me to like be completely vulnerable and open with like the internet and yes. like social media <laughs> than it is for me with my therapist. I like, agree. I'm like, I can't, I can't speak about this with you. Like, it's too personal. Mm -hmm. And like, my therapist is just like, very patient with me. Meanwhile, I've put out like, all of my trauma on yep. my blog. Like, yeah. So it's like, yeah, my it's, friends are like, Oh, I checked your YouTube channel. And apparently you're having a tough time. It didn't sound like that. When I we had a phone oh conversation God. last night. <laughs> oh my God. It was the worst. Because like, when I started my recovery Instagram, I was specifically like, 
no one's allowed to follow me that I yes know. like I was like do not follow me you will not be around like do not uh-huh. know and like and then like one by one my friends started finding my account and like I remember I like posted something about having a bad day or like just like struggling and my friend like called me and I was like I'm not picking up the phone like <laughs> no <laughs> This is purely, this is a private thing between me and Instagram. <laughs> and <laughs> that was like internet. when people found mine, I blocked people who found my Instagram. I'd be like, oh yes, no, 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 no. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's wild, isn't it? I don't know what the psychology is. is behind that, but you know, sometimes you do feel safer with strangers, right? It's true. It's yeah. true. So second, getting to know your question, a song you can listen to on repeat. I have two of those again. Great. I um, love it because I'm still a rule breaker. I did only pick one for the next question, but I got two songs. Mm -hmm. So my like over the past like two to three years song that I will listen to whenever is Bedroom by Litany. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard that song. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing song. I love that song. Um, And then my other song is probably like my current like song that I listen to every morning, which is um, Save Room for Us by Tinashe. Beautiful beautiful and also the music video for that song is like just so fire yeah so I feel like I feel like music videos these days as opposed to when I was a teenager they're actually art now whereas before they were just you watch them now they're just tragic (laughs) yes a little bit a little bit but like I don't know for me like I will listen to a song by an artist that I like and I'm like okay that's a good song and then I watch the music video and if it's good I'm like I love that mm. song like it's, yeah it just like, like makes me like love that song so much more mm-hmm. so yeah. third getting to know your question which book do you think all our listeners should check out what's your number one recommendation see this one's easy for me because I tell everyone that they need to read the book The Rook by mm-hmm. Daniel O'Malley Okay. I tell everyone that. It is my favorite book. Um, It's not like a recovery book or like self-help book. It is literally like a fantasy fiction novel. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of long, but if you want a good audio book, this is like where it's at because Susan Dearden is the best British woman ever. Like, I just love her book, her voice. I've listened to this book four times yeah. and it's like a 17 hour book. Like, I love her voice. Um, (laughs) And I always tell people that if you read this book, you have to come tell me if you liked the part with the duck. Okay. I'll put it on my list. I'm in search for a a new book. I'm going to head down to the bookshop this week and I will. So it's the part with the duck. The part with the duck. Okay. I'll remember that. Cool. You'll hear from me. Um, so so the reason we're here today is in part because we connected over a shared opinion about how recovery was being represented uh, by another creator, which, you know, I have gone over briefly in our introduction. No, no shouting out names in this one. Uh, I've already kind of done that. To say it nicely. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And I was so thrilled to come across you because I love your work. I've told you already, I think you're an absolute natural poet. Your, your writing is so beautiful and your, telling of your story is so searing and honest and just beautifully written. I, I, I always look forward to your posts. And then I found your Daffa Dolphin pins and artwork <laughs> and I have a pin on the way, which I'm so excited about. And we'll be sharing nice. all of that over on Instagram when we put this podcast up. Um, so my first question for you, and I'm so grateful that you have done it. So I really want to know what motivated you to start sharing your recovery? Well, not just your recovery, but also, you know, your thoughts on topics like fat phobia and diet culture. What motivated you to start sharing on Instagram? Like what started, what, like, why did I start sharing on Instagram period? Or why did I start sharing about those topics? Why did you start? What, what motivated you to like put your voice out there? What, what motivated you to start talking about it publicly, all those topics, but particularly your recovery? It was kind of an accident. Um, well, okay. So, so I started a blog in like 2016, I think. Um, I was just, had recently figured out that I had an eating, well, I kind of knew I had an eating disorder, but I started going to a support group. Um, 
in town and I was meeting people who were in recovery and I was kind of learning what recovery was, where I fit, um, what it looked like. And at some point I was like, I need to like talk about and address my trauma. Um, and as, as you've just said, I write. So I basically took my trauma and just like wrote these blog posts that were just like very, very graphic and very like open and just vulnerable and like out there. Um, I have since unlinked that from my bio, but that's like what it was in my bio for a long time because I started my Instagram account solely to just like kind of like quote unquote promote that blog. Um, so I was just going to like post like, like quotes, quotes were a big thing back then. Um, mm -hmm. Like just like quote pictures with like, I don't know, some fancy little stock photo and cute font. Um, a sunrise. And that's like, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I had plenty of those. Yeah. Like some lovely pink font. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that was not what the account was supposed to be. It was mm -hmm. just like these quote photos about my blog. Um, and that's like what I thought it was. And then I got to treatment in 2017. And I think like I posted a picture of like my coffee or something. And like, that was like a big step, <laughs> quote unquote. <laughs> um, and, and then I took the first, the first photo of me on my account is me sitting on one of those like gigantic red target balls outside the store. And I was like, um, something like recovery is like posting pictures of yourself, even if you don't look great. Like, okay, Nia. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I like started posting like photos of me and like photos of like food and places that we went for like food outings and treatment and like um and then it sort of turned into like me posting pictures of like meals that I was eating with like a little like clip of like what I was doing how I was feeling um and then it just kind of the accident happened when I posted um a picture of me in this bathing suit this bikini um that I like went to Torrid and I was like maybe I'll try on a bathing suit because I was like kind of feeling myself that day mm -hmm. um and I like took this photo and was like um maybe I won't post this so I posted it naturally um with like some caption about how like it had been five years since I had like bought a bathing suit or something and like something anti-diet culture probably feeling myself um fighting back in recovery sort of thing mm -hmm. and um someone with a bigger a much bigger account than me reposted that to their account and it kind of went viral um Amazing. yes and no mm. yes and no it was good because i was like i'm getting all these followers i'm getting all this attention this is great but at the same time people were like like um like websites were like we have to write about this girl so like yahoo news wrote an article about me which i didn't know about because mm. at that point i didn't have um google alerts down for my name mm -hmm. um which is a thing by the way yeah. um so i found out that yahoo news had posted this article about me and the article was fine but you know i got to the bottom and there were like 85 comments and i think two of those were nice comments oh of course um, yeah. And of course, I read all of them because, mm -hmm. you know, I hadn't realized yet that you don't read the comments ever. Yeah. Um, it was it was horrible. Like people were like calling me a whale and like saying like I was just disgusting and like, like, how, like how bored do you have to be to go online and just like rip up with like women, like anyone actually, but mm -hmm. like. I don't know like it made me mad but it also like made me upset and like feel like like what I did wasn't okay um, of course I think that's right. a really important point you know there's so much talk about amplifying voices at the moment which it's amazing that someone with a bigger platform sees someone doing amazing work and wants to shout them out that's great but I think there needs to be an extra step where we check in with this person and say is it okay if I reshare this post? Because we know that these things can then 
go like wildfire, right? Once somebody with a bigger mm-hmm, platform mm-hmm. shares, just to kind of at least give us some ability to prepare because once it's out of your yeah. hands, it's really out of your hands. And you don't even know, like, I mean, someone can reach out to you and be like, can I share this? And like, you have like a thousand followers. You're like, oh my God, like, yes. Like you have like a hundred thousand followers. Like, please share it. Like, it'll get me so much attention. Mm -hmm. You don't know like that you're going to get like horrible troll comments. Like, that's not like what you think because I mean, at least for me, I generally think good of people. Mm -hmm. So like, I wasn't thinking like, oh my God, I got posted and now people are gonna like make fun of me so how did yeah, you deal with that horrible. given you were in how the recovery process that? how did I deal with that um I think I was kind of I was already kind of like in this place of like depressed not depressed um in and out kind of um so it wasn't great but my best friend was definitely like you don't read the comments. (laughs) She was like, you don't do that. Mm -hmm. She's like, don't do that again. Um, (laughs) And then she had me set up um, Google alerts for my name and my screen name. So now if someone posts some, like an article with my name in it, I know, um, Mm. which is good. But oh yeah, it was, I think I was just like spiraling out for a little bit, but we went to like my roommate's family's house like for the 4th of July I think this was all around like this time like three years ago Mm -hmm. um and you know all the kids because they had three kids they went swimming in the pool in the backyard and they were just like like Nia come swim with us and I was like no I'm good (laughs) like and I was like I don't want to like I brought my bathing suit but like you know I just felt embarrassed and I didn't really want to do it and um I ended up being like okay whatever like screw it um and I did go jump in the pool with the kids and we had a good time and like I wore the bathing suit and I think that was like a big step for me um so to answer the other part of your question I think part of like why I started posting about like fat phobia and anti-fatness and just like etc all of that um (laughs) was because like I got pissed like I just was like annoyed at the world and like annoyed at like all of the years that I had like gone through and of course like seeing other people post about that stuff like I learned like what in my life was like fat phobic what i was doing was fat phobic um what was inappropriate um what was like harmful um i think everyone kind of has that awakening if they're in that space because we come to it with just like blinders and sunglasses on so we can't see anything um and then someone's like here's the sunshine like yeah. and then you see it and you're like oh damn like oh like that's what I've been doing that's what I've been like taking in like all these comments aren't normal I like they're not true like yeah so I got pissed it's like I think breathing in air you can't see air right it's what you kind of you just do it without questioning Mm -hmm. it and then once you realize that there's so much toxicity in what we're just subconsciously internalizing it's like you suddenly de- you get a little detector out and it's like oh my god there's fumes in the air I've been breathing in fumes like <laughs> Sorry. there's been like toxic stuff pumping into my lungs all these years and I didn't know because it's just everywhere and it's insidious and it's hidden and it's just our normal and then you wake up to it and I remember experiencing a similar level of anger more so about the fact that I was like I have been so profitable. Like <laughs> I have, my self-esteem has been living in somebody's profit margin for so long and yes. it's painful. It's really painful to realize that you kind of just went through your life on autopilot a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And how much like all the diet you. books I've bought, mm-hmm. all the diet books I've bought. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. So many diet books. Mm-hmm. Like, it's ridiculous like something popped up on Facebook the other day and it was like this diet book and it was like a personalized diet book and they showed you pages and I was like 
oh, that's a cute book. And then I was like, Nia, stop it. <laughs> I was like, Where? but they used pink. Who is that it person? Was it was so cute. And yeah. then I was like, and that's how they got me every time because they used the cute colors with the cool pictures. Like, mm-hmm. ugh, ugh. They know how to appeal to that part in all of us. And right. I think that they even when the you- cute colors. Yep. No. Yep. And they're constantly I- repackaging it and remarketing it and then, you know, co-opting uh, messages. Like I remember there was a book that came out. It was actually like a British reality TV star came out with a diet and exercise book called how to be body positive. <laughs> no, no. And she was like, I'm going to, I may, but I'm making your body, your experience with your body more positive. And it's like, Oh wow. We're really here now. This is where we are. Oh, we are so there. We are oh, we're so, so we're, there. We've, we've traveled beyond there. I don't even know where we are now. Like, like the fact that like the biggest loser season this year was the wellness season. Adorable. Like, oh my God. Oh, I like, I haven't watched it yet. I might watch it just because I know that it's like just ridiculousness, mm-hmm. but like, honestly, like in college, like the biggest loser was my show. Like that was my, sh- like I was obsessed. Like I went to one of the finale tapings. Like I am on camera, like jumping up and down, super excited. Like <laughs> yeah. I met Bob Harper. Like I went to the after party. I still have the damn dessert cookbook on my bookshelf that's signed by all of the contestants. Like yeah. can't let that go. Could be worth money. Who knows? But like, oh my gosh. Like, I was so obsessed with those, like, just, I was obsessed with diet culture. Like, Mm -hmm. I was living in it, swimming in it. Mm -hmm. So what, other than, obviously, those experiences of, you know, the highs of connecting with people through community, et cetera, and then the lows of that being taken out of your hands and being trolled via a news website, what are some of the pros and cons that you've experienced in sharing your experience online? What are the negatives and the positives? Um, I would say the positives have, like, varied, um, but definitely, like, connecting with people, um, me finding, like, accountability was a big thing when I first got out of treatment, like, I literally posted, like, every meal, every snack on Instagram, like, you can scroll back and find it, like, Mm -hmm. just because I knew that, like, if I didn't have to post it, like, I wasn't gonna eat it, um so that was a big thing because like I couldn't find accountability outside of me and so I found it in Instagram um so that was a big um I mean I've met so many really amazing people through Instagram um like and not just like you know people that you talk to here and there like once in your dms but like people who I like have like friendships with and like I call them like if I have a problem um like yeah so like extensive friendships that have gone places um I've had so many opportunities that like have been given to me especially in the last month um like this past weekend I spoke at the Nita Warrior experience like brilliant and that was like I I I sorry I've given five Nita speeches this year like that's been amazing um just sharing my story and like hearing people say that like they related to like what I said like it kind of makes me feel that like all of the shit that I have gone through for like 27 years almost 28 is like not worthless you know like I'm able to like have other people hear that and have it make a difference to them um cons I would say the main con is trolling yeah um horrible people doing horrible things and sometimes like I mean I guess it depends on the day whether I'm like willing to play with them or not like whether I'm willing to play their game or not like someone messaged me and like I swear it was not English um but like used the word fat phobic and I could tell they were trolling me um and I was like, are you serious? And they were like, yes. And I was like, oh, good. I thought you weren't. So I, I'm glad I don't have to pay attention to you anymore. Mm-hmm. And they didn't like that. Um, <laughs> so like, sometimes I will engage. Sometimes I just block them. Usually, even if I block them, I will screenshot it and send it to someone and be like, look at this. Um, 
because like some of it's just ridiculous like people just like have nothing better to do Mm -hmm. um I think I've gotten a lot more tougher skin but at the same time when you post more you get more trolling and then it makes you not want to post as much so like I definitely go through phases of like posting every day and like not posting for like a week um not posting for a couple weeks like it's up and down based on like how much attention I'm getting and like whether it's negative or not um Mm -hmm. also pro con we already talked about it but like people that I know finding out my deepest darkest secrets and intimate details like I mean it's probably good because then people know me but at the same time I'm like I didn't want you to know that much I had you locked down in this one compartment of my brain and now (laughs) you're spilling over into this other one where you're not supposed to be like it messes with my compartmentalism. Yes. It's sort of like, you know, it's probably good. Even when you're dating someone and they find everything and you're like, Oh my my gosh, (laughs) that would be horrible. I didn't even think about that. I'm never dating. And then they, (laughs) and then they know all this stuff. And then there's the assumption that like, like you want to talk to them about it. And you're like, this is the second date. I'm not really ready for the childhood trauma component of my history. (laughs) We can wait just a little while. Keep enjoying. If, if you give me five material. minutes, I'll pull up the, the PowerPoint. But you know, just <laughs> yeah, give I'll, me a this second. This is the I'll exact video you need to watch. There you go. Like, <laughs> you can watch, watch videos one through five, and yeah. then watch ten, twelve, and then fourteen. <laughs> <laughs> then circle back to three, and that will answer all of your <laughs> remaining questions. Right? Yeah. There we so go. True. Glad we're all on the same page. <laughs> yeah, it's so yeah. true. It is that strange, uh, like you said, experience of totally being comfortable being vulnerable to thousands and then certain individuals it's like oh no 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 we we're not talking right about this. yeah right yeah because i think you don't expect that like the people that you are being like totally radically honest with like mm-hmm. you're not going to see them tomorrow or That's like right. you're not going to go to work and they're going to be there like they don't write your paycheck or like they don't um like I don't know, sign your insurance papers like your therapist does. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a level of trust that you have to actually create with the, like, people in your life who, like, you have a lasting relationship with. And being completely vulnerable on the first date usually pushes people away. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Here's the, here's the history and timeline of my mental illnesses. (laughs) Right? (laughs) All five of them. Let's just break it down. Let's be real. If, somebody did that I'd be like great let's let's look at this thing let's not wait till we're six months in to discover this stuff let's just get it all out on the table (laughs) I would be like but you got to show me your YouTube channel first (laughs) I'll give you seven years you just fill that with your content of your life and then we'll be on the same page um so I think that's fantastic that you um you've been so involved with Nita from that perspective of sharing your experience etc uh, what are your thoughts about representation and diversity as it relates to not just organizations like NIDA, but recovery spaces that we find even online, like social media and media representation from a more general standpoint? What are your thoughts on diversity as it relates to size, as it relates to race, as it relates to gender, as it relates to, you know, a severe lack of trans representation. What are your thoughts about representation and diversity with recovery spaces at the moment? I talk about this on Instagram, obviously. Um, but I mean, it just, it just bugs me. It gets me. Um, especially because like so many fat people, so many people of color just like think that they are not affected by mental illness or eating disorders specifically in this case because they are fat, they are black, they are Latinx, um, they are trans. um, Like it just, since you're not like the thin white woman Mm -hmm. version of anorexia, um, you feel like you don't fit that profile. Like, I probably knew that 
I think around the time that I knew that something was wrong was like freshman year in college. And at that point, I was like chatting up a storm on Blogger with um, all of these thin women and they were all not eating anything really. And I was trying to not eat anything, but I was like, definitely like, these people are really sick. Like these, these people need help. Um, I'll, I definitely think they need help, but like, I'm just going to lose this amount of weight and and then i'll then i'll get help you know once it's a problem once Mm -hmm. once like i've lost too much weight or like once when i'm like at a good weight then i'll start eating pizza again like no like i i think i knew in the back of something was like wrong and i actually did um after freshman year in college ask my family if i could go to an iop program um and they were kind of like well, we don't think you really need to go, plus the insurance money is really expensive, so why don't you just check out Overeaters Anonymous? Um, And I was like, okay, um, thanks. And (laughs) I've been to like three Overeaters Anonymous meetings in my life, and none of them were good. Mm -mm. good. What are your thoughts? And I kept going to be like, maybe it was a bad group. No, no, it was just the whole thing. It was the whole thing. Yeah. So what, what were you, just as a side note, what, what was your experience with Overeaters Anonymous and what's your takeaway about that, that sort of approach? This guy did like, this guy did like a 25 minute speech about how we couldn't eat donuts, like, or else like he could, like, he just couldn't stop eating donuts. And it was just like really upsetting for him and how he had gone on for like, I don't even know how many years without eating donuts. And then he started eating donuts again. And it was just like the end of his abstinence. And like, I was like, why are we sitting here listening to this guy talking about restricting food? Like, is anyone concerned here? Mm -hmm. And like, the thing is like Overeaters Anonymous, sure. It's like supposedly for people who compulsively overeat and binge eating, but you also have people with bulimia, you have people with anorexia who also go, and, like, they're listening to this guy talk about not eating donuts, too, and no one's saying anything, Mm -hmm. like, so, it's that frightening old school approach that as soon as we go into, you know, any kind of binge eating behavior, it now it's about the food, oh, that's not, that's not, like, a mental illness thing you've got to deal with, it's just the food, and that'll fix it, it's like, I'm sorry, have we are we all lost on the idea that these are all mental illnesses and that a lot of our experiences mentally are the same it's just the it's just the symptom is how you interact with the food but this is like the same wound it's just it expresses itself differently it's wild to me that something like ovaries yes. anonymous still exists yes. like i think in high school someone came to like i went to boarding school someone came to campus and talked about eating disorders to like my dorm one night I kind of remember this and they were like well if you eat like a whole bag of chips or you eat like lots of weird things then you have an eating disorder and it's a problem and I was sitting there like well I've eaten a whole bag of chips before and like at that point I did actually have an eating disorder and I did have like a binge eating problem quote unquote problem um but I remember talking to her afterwards and she was like well do you like eat copious amounts of mustard and I was like no and she was like oh you don't have a problem then (gasps) as if like only only if you binge on mustard only if you binge on mustard do you have a problem like like even if it was like freaking carrots, like it's still a problem. Like I need help. Like well, this is the thing. This is the thing is that I've had that experience with clients who come to me and they've been in the Overeaters Anonymous program or they've had a treatment um, experience that's kind of replicated that concept. And they've been told, you know, you have problem foods, you just cut those problem foods out. And then exactly. they go home and they do binge on a bag of carrots because it doesn't matter what the food is. It's the mechanism. Exactly. It's why you're doing it. It's the feeling. It's the internal experience. Yes. Doesn't yes. Like, and then they feel shame because they feel like they're doing it wrong. Right. So then they can't go back and yes. say, this is still happening. So you've got all these people masquerading as like, oh yeah, my problem solved. Well, unless you're getting to the bottom of that compulsion and where that's coming from, nothing's fixed i'm sorry totally it's surface, a whole mess surface it's problem. a whole mess yes 
Yes. Yeah. So I hadn't thought about that mustard thing in a while, but that <laughs> that kind of cracks me up. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> like as if like, as if be only new... if I was eating mustard was I sick. <laughs> it's be my new client intake question. Just one question. What's your relationship like with mustard? <laughs> uh, do you do you feel like you eat too much mustard at times? <laughs> and at that point, like what I genuinely mustard? hated mustard too. Like if she was like, "Do you eat copious amounts of ketchup?" I'd be like, "Heck yes!" But like, no, wrong condiment, Nia. Wrong condiment. <laughs> wrong condiment. Wrong condiment. <laughs> So that so, was the whole thing. So in terms of that um, sort of the diversity that we're seeing online currently and, and with bigger organizations, et cetera, that lack of diversity, what do you feel like that had a direct impact on your own trajectory since going into treatment? Do you feel like um, that even shows up in treatment spaces? It does. It does a hundred percent. Well, Okay. Maybe not 100%. I can't speak for all treatment centers, but I can speak for mine. And that was a hot mess um, (laughs) because like it was like I was the only person who was black. I was the only person who was fat. Mm -hmm. Um, We did not have any trans people. We did not have any non-binary people. Um, We had people who were like maybe small fats slash small plus size like not like they were still probably straight size to be honest but um it was really it was me and the dietitian who I, I love her she was great um but well I say she's great but then there's a but um mm-hmm. she was definitely like if I was losing weight she was like oh your weight's trending down this is good um and then if I was gaining weight she was like um so maybe we need to look at the meal plan. Are you really following the meal plan? Um, and like, you know, to me, I was thinking at that point in treatment, like I'm in treatment to get thin, like recovery is thinness. Like I, like, like, honestly, I think I thought that recovery was just like another way to reach the body that I needed to be in. And that to me was thin. Um, and this was like, the one time that they would teach me like how to not binge and how to like eat in moderation and I would be thin at the end and dude I had to let that go like I had to let that I didn't let that go in treatment in treatment I was still holding on to that like a safety blanket but well, no wonder I mean this is what blows my mind that this is still a feature of treatment that we have this yes. very non-physical approach i mean yes of course with people who are underweight part of the goal is to weight restore but then we acknowledge that there's this ongoing process where it's like well that's you know a domino that we've got to knock over and then it's as we've talked about it's about the mental process it's about how you relate to food how you relate to yourself how you talk to yourself finding you know, purpose outside of your appearance, finding worth beyond your appearance. Whereas with people who are going through recovery in larger bodies, part of the message we're sending them is, oh, it's okay for us to prescribe you not only eating restrictive eating disorder behaviors, but that mentality as well. That part of your quote unquote success is losing weight, you know, get, but going into a smaller body, which if we said that to somebody who was straight sized or, you know, clinically, medically underweight, it would, it would be horrifying, you know, to most treatment professionals. Oh, it would never happen. It would, it would never, never happen. happen. It would never happen. And if it did, it would be, you know, ethically, we've kind of got to get rid of this person or get rid of this model of treatment because it's unethical. But when it comes to larger bodies going through this experience, it's okay to prescribe eating disorder behaviors and an eating disorder mentality how did you and it was the sneaky words of like trending downwards like they didn't say lose weight they said trending downwards and with a positive spin on that like yes exactly that's great ignoring the fact that an eating disorder mentality as we've said it's the mentality is similar across the board and you have somebody Mm -hmm, with an eating mm -hmm. disorder mentality that's expressing itself in one way it's not crazy to think that maybe then they'll just switch gears into a different 
set of behaviors, right? But you're condoning their desire to be in a smaller body from a treatment perspective. It's just, it's just wrong. It's so, so wrong and so dangerous. And that's actually what happened to me because I went into treatment with a diagnosis of bulimia non-purge type Mm -hmm. because I was binge eating and then I was just like restricting for a long period of time um, to like compensate for that binge eating. And so it was just like the cycle of like binge restrict, binge restrict. And so that's why I went in with bulimia. But in treatment, um, I actually stopped binging. Um, I remember like driving past Jack in the Box and I was like, oh, I really want to go to Jack in the Box. But but then I have to tell them at treatment tomorrow that I binged because I'm like a very like radically honest, like accountable person when it comes to like my therapist. Like, of course, I'm going to go to treatment and be like, yeah, I, I binged last night. Um, I'm not going to like keep it to myself. Like, mm-hmm. I'm going to be honest about that. So I was like, then I got to like fess up to it. So like, I won't binge. And I like didn't binge for a long period of time. But the, I mean, well, the problem was that the restricting was still going. So then I was just consistently restricting without the binging and then I wasn't getting like that boost of calories that I was getting from binge eating I was just restricting and so then that led to like me losing my period later and like all this other stuff and like I mean I switched from like one thing to another thing and everyone was just like so excited that I wasn't binge eating anymore but like please eat Nia but like it's still great that you're not binge eating. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was just all, it was a mess. Well, that is my other frustration is with the term atypical anorexia. Oh, when the majority, (laughs) the majority, the majority of people with anorexia are the atypical anorexia type, which would mean it's probably not atypical. (laughs) Right. Exactly. You would Sort of an oxymoron, right? It's just um, like, um, we just don't want to admit that we made a mistake yeah. kind of anorexia. <laughs> we don't want to have to throw yeah. out like the whole DSM-5. Like that's just such a waste of paper. Right. <laughs> it's so much easier when we just copy and paste paragraphs. Yeah. Than, yeah. yeah, exactly. Let's exactly. just send a really like fat phobic diagnosis out there. That's, that's way better. But like, it's okay if you're fat. It's not a bad thing. But like, no. you're not going to get the real, the real title of like your disease. Like, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And if you lose weight, excellent. Great message. <laughs> Just as a side Great note. All around message. If, if you're it. trending downwards, that's, that's good. That's good. <laughs> Gold star. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, how you then process that when you had your dietitian kind of acknowledging and almost congratulating you on on weight loss or or at least encouraging it from some standpoint were you immediately aware that that was probably not an appropriate reaction from her or did it did it sort of click later on it clicked later on Mm -hmm. um I think um I think once I learned a little bit more about intuitive eating kind of um and then also um because well going back so I went to treatment I got out of treatment I saw this other therapist who wasn't from treatment at all but I was still seeing my dietitian and my dietitian had my therapist weigh me in session um so my therapist would constantly be like um she wouldn't tell me what my weight was but she would allude to the fact that I was gaining weight Mm -hmm. and that maybe I should be eating more consistently because my body was holding on to weight because I was restricting something along those lines. So then like a year later, I, what happened? I somehow found out my weight. I think I weighed myself. Um, and I found out my weight and I was livid because I was like, you let me go for like six months to 12 months and you let me gain all of this weight and you didn't tell me like like you should have told me i would have like started eating if i knew that i was gaining weight instead of losing weight like who knows if that's really true <laughs> who knows if that's really true but that was like my mental decision um and so i think at that point i was like back on like the i need to lose weight train and that that train kept running for a good part of 2018 And then I decided, I was like watching a lot of YouTube and stuff. And I decided that I was going to try mini mod. 
Um, and Mini Mod went against everything they had told me in treatment. Which it was 2,500 sort of calories like, a day minimum. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like saying like, I needed more food than I was getting. I, was, I needed more food than I was probably getting on my meal plan. Um, and I needed to do it like every day. And I remember I reached out to my dietitian and was like, have you heard of this? Like, is this an okay thing to do? And she was like, just, just add another protein to your snack. Um, like, don't, don't eat that much. Just add another protein to your snack. And I was kind of like, at that point, I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what's right. Like, I don't know if I should be following my meal plan or if I should be doing mini mod, if I need more calories, if I don't. And I honestly felt so lost. Mm -hmm. And I felt lost because everyone who was doing mini mod was thin and white and they had gained some weight, but sure they went down to an, like a socially acceptable body. And I could find no research at all on whether mini mod was acceptable for a fat body. Um, and that just like, like I, I just didn't know what to do. So I kind of was just like, you know what, screw it, throw it all out the window. I'm gonna try it. Um, I was like, if I gain a ton of weight, I already did that once. So like, can it be that bad? Um, and so I did mini mod and I kind of at that point realized that maybe my dietitian had been wrong. Maybe her encouraging me to like stick to like a cheese stick and like an apple and a cracker was like, not okay. Like, mm -hmm. and I think from there, I like looked back on my treatment with more of a critical lens of like, this was very like anti-fat and this was like not an appropriate treatment experience. Mm -hmm. But I did not know that for probably like a year and a half, two mm -hmm. years almost. I so. think that is what is very frustrating and deeply fat phobic is that there's always an assumption for those in larger bodies going through. And I even see it with some people who have been, you know, uh, mentors of mine where it wasn't until mm -hmm. I started unpacking fat phobia, my own fat phobia, you know, as it pertains to diet culture and recovery, that there's always this assumption that it's just binge eating disorder. That's the only, there's, there can't be any restriction oh, bulimic oh. behaviors. And so you see people being, <laughs> you know, like diagnosed based on their appearance, right? Which we would don't accept for people in more straight sized bodies, but it, there's always the, uh, assumption oh well that's well we're talking about binge eating disorder how do you know how do you know that's the most upsetting thing to me like that some things make me livid like mm -hmm. like yeah but that's one of the things that makes me so upset because mm -hmm. it is the automatic assumption like when I moved to Nebraska and I started seeing this therapist I will preface this by saying she was a horrible therapist she should have never been seeing people um so like let's keep that in mind They're out but, there. but at that point like I was restricting I was not binging and um I went in and I told them like you know my problem is restricting I'm not binging but like I'm restricting a lot and like I think on three different occasions she was like so let's talk about the binge eating uh, let's work on the binge eating and I was like I don't have a problem with binge eating right now. Like, that's not my issue. Like, I got so mad. Like, mm -hmm. like I can tell that you are just, like, going off of what you see. Like, that's not my problem. Like, mm -hmm. oh, like, just to be heard. Like, even when I'd said it at the beginning. Like, even when I had, like, I had met this treatment group through giving my Nita speech, my first Nita speech that I gave. And in that speech, I talked about how my issue was restricting. Mm -hmm. So from the first time you've met me, you know what my problem is. So you are willfully ignoring that and going off of my body size and assuming that I am lying. Weight stigma, right? Weight stigma. Oh, totally. The only body type, the only body type is, you know, sort of in the larger body um, area where we believe that by looking someone we can diagnose them physically with all manner of things that we can diagnose their eating disorder just by looking at people right it's it's just this uh exactly. it, that's that's where that health at every size i think if there's any place where the health at every size paradigm and model is most relevant it's that 
how can you look at someone coming to you for eating disorder treatment and just immediately assume their behaviors, their diagnosis, and just pre-categorize them and say, well, you know, you're not even believable because I can, I can already tell from your appearance how you're, I can you know, see it on you're you. behaving. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it is so, the most demeaning thing ever. It is. And it's also just, I can imagine, because I, look, I started off in, uh, like I was in a larger body for my teen years, m- much of my teen years and some of my 20s. Started off with binge eating disorder, that morphed into bulimia, which then morphed into anorexia, binge purge subtype. Guess when my behaviors were problematic to people and taken seriously? Oh, when you had lost the weight and were yeah. anorexic probably yeah stereotype then and i wasn't even you know the classic stereotype that most you know people think of who don't have any experience with what eating disorders really look like um even then i was not believed even then i was not believed so that's how much you can then assume that we're just letting the majority of people down <laughs> like right? i bring this I bring this story up because it sticks with me, but it is, it's an episode of Grey's Anatomy, but um, there's an episode where there's this fat black woman, she comes in and she's not doing well. And they're like trying to treat her with all of this stuff. And they eventually just like discharge her, um, even though she's obviously having issues. Mm -hmm. And she basically drops dead outside the hospital. And they find out that it's because she's lost like a large, a large amount of weight in a year. And she was essentially anorexic and she had eaten away all of her heart muscle. Mm -hmm. And so she died. And in someone who is like clinically emaciated and underweight, like extremely, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for their heart muscle to be eaten up. You're looking for all their muscles to be just gone. And Mm -hmm them to not be functioning but because she was still in a fat body no one could see it except for like the one doctor who figured it out Mm -hmm. like and that just like has always stuck with me because like even when I was like I am going to like not eat and lose weight I was like but I can still screw my body up yeah but fat fat phobia is killing people it's killing people oh yes it's even um you know, from the standpoint of race, I, I think I sent you that stat uh, about how mm-hmm. eating disorders were identified in different groups. And I'll just read from that. It's from the NIDA website, uh, yeah. which is uh, women of color in the United States face substantially more stress resulting from their membership in multiple subordinate groups than that caused by acculturation alone. Eating disorders in women of color may be in part a response to environment stress, i.e. abuse, racism, poverty. Therefore, given the multiple traumas that women of color are exposed to, they may be more vulnerable to eating disorders. And this is then in terms of uh, their chance of being diagnosed by a medical professional. Mm -hmm. When presented with identical case studies demonstrating disordered eating symptoms, In white, Hispanic, and black women, clinicians were asked to identify if the woman's eating behavior was problematic. 44% identified the white woman's behavior as problematic. 41% identified the Hispanic woman's behavior as problematic. And only 17% identified the black woman's behavior as problematic. The clinicians were also less likely to recommend that the black woman should receive professional help. So there are, we can talk about it just from, you know, a a sort of a philosophical standpoint, but there are real world implications, health implications and survival implications when it comes to our beliefs and stereotypes and the true presence of fat phobia and particularly clearly racism and discrimination within our treatment spaces, our recovery spaces, representation within our organizations and how we see, you know, eating disorders being presented in media. Um, And you mentioned that you were the only black person in sort of your treatment experience in patient. What kind of, what kind of impact did that have on your treatment or has that had on your recovery more generally that lack of um, representation? I'm sure there is a good deal of, my eating disorder and my mental health in general that is related to racism um that just has never been addressed um actually 
last week in my therapy session because I'm now seeing two therapists, um, one for eating disorder stuff, one for EMDR. And I've only started seeing the EMDR therapist this month. Um, but she asked me, we were talking, because one of the important parts about EMDR is like creating like a safe space um, that you can like go to when you're like working on trauma. You can like go back to your safe space, calm down, et cetera. Um, and I was explaining to her that I don't feel safe anywhere because there has been a black person killed in just about any situation that you can think of. Um, like you would think that like being at home, locking the door, you feel safe. Breonna Taylor mm -hmm. was shot to death in her bed. Um, so now, now I get to like wake up in the night and be terrified that someone might knock on my door and that it's the police. Um, and so like, for me, like being in my car makes me feel safe sometimes when I'm just driving, having a good time. Well, Sandra Bland was pulled over for not using her turn signal and ended up dead three days later. Um, so where am I supposed to go where I feel safe? How am I supposed to address my trauma if I can't find a safe space? So I think that that is probably crucial to my healing of my mental illnesses and yet it's very inaccessible to me because i i can't i literally can't access it because of my race because of my skin color um and this was my my emdr therapist is white and normally i just won't bring up race at all with a white therapist i just leave it alone um but i felt like with everything going on in the world right now may, maybe she would hear it maybe maybe a month ago she wouldn't have heard it um i think she's actually a very open person but her response was like that makes total and complete sense that like you would not feel safe anywhere and she wasn't like trying to like force me to like think of a safe space or like you know it's okay that's not gonna happen to you like it wasn't that sort of stuff it was just very much like validating that like it's not safe to be a black person in america right now mm -hmm. uh, well ever <laughs> in the last 400 years at least um so yeah like it's just very very apparent to me um especially now mm -hmm. and then as we we're talking about you then compile that with you know internally or or within your own life no safe space but then within treatment as well, that there is, you know, those biases and that discrimination, which then makes treatment in some ways unsafe or unwelcoming or inhospitable. Um, I mean, it literally makes all medical health care unsafe. Like, yes. like in addition to the statistics that you read out, mm -hmm. um, I watched another video. I don't know the percentage, but like just the amount of doctors that admitted that they do not believe black women when they say they're in pain and that leads to the high maternal death rate that we have and like even when I was in the hospital like doubled over in pain having a gallbladder attack in college like and if anyone's ever had a gallbladder attack or passed a kidney stone you know how painful that is he, like the doctor did not believe that I was in pain he thought I just wanted drugs and like if anyone knows me, I am the farthest person away from trying to get drugs. And he like refused to give me morphine until the nurse like made him. And then they gave me two doses of morphine and let me drive myself home. No. So yeah. So I, that was like, and at the time I just like didn't even connect that like that might've been racism or that that might've even been a problem to let me drive home on drugs. Like, Yeah. Like mm -hmm. just the way that we are treated is just despicable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what needs to change in terms of, you know, there's a few, all the categories. <laughs> Recovery spaces like, do on. We, do we have time? Do we have time <laughs> for that? Uh, yeah, so we're going to be here for the next 12 hours. Um, <laughs> in, ter in terms of sort of recovery. This is a long ass podcast episode. <laughs> part one of 73 um so in terms of recovery spaces online um in treatment spaces with organizations like NIDA or here in Australia with you know the Butterfly Foundation what needs to change for all sufferers to feel 
seen and validated and for us to meet the needs of, you know, people who need to be seen and heard and, and represented? What, what, are the, what are a couple of key things that you think needs to change? People need to decenter themselves and organizations need to actively hire people of color and fat people um, and trans people and non-binary people and disabled people. And there is a long ass list that people are not doing um, mm -hmm. on top of people making buildings that they are working in handicap accessible. That's a whole nother story. But um, NIDA needs to hire black people because everyone at NIDA looks like the white girl fin anorexic trope there's enough um, of this yes there's enough they of this. look like you they there's look enough like of you. this <laughs> <laughs> and like and like um i would say that nita needs well okay nita does need to hire more fat people they need to hire some fat black they need to hire me is what they need to do but um i will say they do have shavise turner i love her she is amazing but She's working there because Nita and Vita, which is the binge eating disorder of America, um, or association, not America, sorry, messed that up. Um, they merged. Yeah. So Shavit was the founder of Vita, and because they merged, she now works at Nita. So mm -hmm. they got a fat person out of that. Um, and it kind of feels like checking a box on a screen or something. Like, you know, like they need to actively be hiring the people that they supposedly are trying to represent because mm -hmm. no one's going to like take that information to heart if the organization doesn't even represent who they're saying they represent. Yeah, that's been my takeaway, you know, with the deep education that, you know, white people like myself have been on in the last month is it's not just about story reshares. It's not just about, you know, passing the mic so to say it's about putting pressure on these organizations to diversify at every single level but particularly senior levels and particularly you know from a NIDA standpoint with ambassadors with the the faces that they're presenting as you know the experience of eating disorders but particularly how they hire how they recruit who is in those boardrooms who is there directing the course of their campaigns and uh, mm -hmm. really having them in the room to say, this is, this is your blind spot. You can't see who we're leaving out, but I can. So we need to do more. We need to do better. Right. Right. Because it's, it's one thing. And I talked about this with someone on my podcast where you like are deciding like, this would be a good thing for the black community. You're like, this is what the black community needs. They need help with this. This would be great for them. And then you actually go to the black community and you're like, what do you need? And they're like, well, Nothing. I need help with like <laughs> this other thing. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, that's cool. But like, I need help with this other thing first. This other thing is way more important to me and like all of us over here. And then well, now you're working on the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like now you're not actually helping. You're just like putting a, I was going to say you're putting a Band-Aid on it. And then I realized Band-Aids came out with fucking, sorry, sorry. Oh, I no, you can swear that. on this podcast. It's fine. Oh, Go okay. for it. I don't even get demonetized on YouTube for these. It's great. She's like, can we go back and do it again? I want to swear through this whole thing. <laughs> I know. Let's go back. Let's go back. But Band-Aids came out with skin color like Band-Aids. Like that. That should should have been done in the '90s, like at the least. Mm -hmm. Like, like you, like, like we are fighting for the end of police brutality and like anti-racism, and you're like, here's a band aid that matches your skin. <laughs> here's a literal band aid. Aren't you? Aren't you happy now? Aren't, it's a metaphor and it's literal. <laughs> Don't, don't you feel so much better now that this Band-Aid matches your skin? Yeah. Like, I don't give a shit about Band-Aids. Like, mm -mm. I have been using the white people's skin tone Band-Aids since I was, like, two. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep using them. Like, I don't need one that matches my skin tone. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm done with that. Like, yeah. no. I, what I need you to do is put out a statement that actually matters, and then I need you to back it up. 
take real action, make real change and institutional exactly. change. Exactly. Yeah. Like I'm over people being like, we're doing um, implicit bias training and we're like talking to our employees and we are, we're thinking of ways that we can make the organization more diverse. Like, no, like you look at, um, what's his name? Serena Williams' husband, who literally stepped down from Reddit. He was mm -hmm. a co-founder and said, hire a black person in my place. Like, do the, do that the thing. Is do the thing. That is allyship. Like literally, yeah. like taking your power, lessening it and giving that power to a person of color. Mm -hmm. Like, like that is literally being an ally. And like so many white people are like, I, p I posted a black square on Instagram on a Tuesday. Like, look at, look at me. Look, look at how much I care about you. Mm -hmm. here, oh no, here first, is a brown, first I here's tagged a brown it. Black, first, I, first I tagged it Black Lives Matter and completely whitewashed oh. the hashtag. Oh, yes. Oh, and first, first I tagged I screwed it Black up. Lives Matter and then I took the hashtag off. I didn't even delete the post no. and repost it. That's right. I just deleted the hashtag, so it mm -hmm. stayed there. Mm -hmm. But look at how much I'm helping. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like, oh, oh, this whole month has just been like me, like at the end of my rope, like Exhausting. hanging on by like two I fingers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just like watching watching the sheer capacity mm -hmm. of the world right now is just like upsetting yeah yeah long naps long naps long naps yeah long naps. <laughs> so nia thank you so much for coming and chatting to us today i have enjoyed this so much we are definitely doing this again because like i oh, said yes. part, part one of 73 um <laughs> can you let people know where they can find you. All of this will be in the show notes, but where is the best place for people to come and read your amazing work, see what you're doing, be able to support you? Where can people come and find you? So the best place to find me is on Instagram mm -hmm. at the friend I never wanted. Um, that is all one word. There are no dashes. It is just the friend I never wanted on Instagram. Um, and then you can also go to my website, which is not updated, but it's thefriendinevernwanted.com. If you want to find out um, about my art and about like my products that I sell, which are mainly enamel pins, stickers, greeting cards, prints, um, that I'll put is. Some, I'll put some images of them up here, just so you know. I'll have Ooh. photos oh, nice. of them up. Yeah. Because because you're a master YouTuber. Oh, that's um, I know how to cut and paste. She's a genius. Um, I can't even tell you how long that would take me. So it's fine. Just accept it. Um, you can go to the dapperdolphinco.com. That is my website. You can also find me on Instagram at the Dapper Dolphin. Um, and then I also, also have a podcast. If you want to check that out, it is Body Trauma. Um, and you can find that at bodytraumapod.com. Fantastic. So yeah, those are all my links. All of that will be in the show notes for Apple and Spotify. And it will also be in the description box for YouTube, which is where this video will be. Thank you so much, Nia. I, like I said, so appreciate this. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your work. And I, yeah, can't wait to see what you do and can't wait to have you back. Thank you for having me. This has been really fun, even though I got a little heated there about I the band-aids. No, I love it. I love it. Warranted. <laughs> so warranted. Um, so uh, yeah, please do come back. And uh, yeah, I just think you're amazing. So thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Thanks, Nia.